How are we doing? Yes. All right. So let's see, we have... Um, Yuan and Palin. Great. Okay. Hi. Hi. I'm ready to go. Okay, let's uh, get started. So I hope things are going well. Um, I hope you're, um, you've started on the second mini project that's due at the end of next week, right, just for spring break. I hope that's all going okay. Um, today we have a practical looking at reverberation. We have basically, there's this um, reverberation algorithm that comes packaged with, with PD, which I've sort of copied and uh, put a few hooks into it so we can, we can try different things and just sort of try and exper investigate the relationship between the controls and the structure and, and what it sounds like. But before that, we have a couple of presentations. And so, I guess, first up is Yuan Gao, do you want to come up? You ready? Yeah. Okay. What are you going to use? Okay. Just fuck this. Yeah. This. This is for audio. Yeah. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, my topic is about um, granular synthesis and um, it's a very straightforward um, synthesis method and it's not as scary as it, its name. So, um, let's see. Uh, uh, granular synthesis actually uh, started from the 1940s and uh, uh, the pioneers uh, includes uh, the famous physicist uh, Dennis Gaber and uh, the Greek composer Yanis Zanakis. And uh, uh, the, a Canadian uh, professor, uh, Curtis Rose, he uh, developed the uh, first computer-based implement implementations of uh, granular synthesis in 1974. So um, what is uh, granular synthesis exactly? Um, it's uh, unlike unlike additive synthesis or subtractive synthesis. Uh, it is said to be operating on a uh, microsound time scale, and the basic unit it worked with is called grain. So, um, which are just small pieces of sound, and you can see these grains are uh, mostly um, less than ten milliseconds to uh, just over a uh, hundred milliseconds. So. Um, each of uh, so sound events and sound objects can be generated by uh, a uh, group of thousands of s such sound grains. So the um, each grain can be adjusted by uh, dozens of parameters. So it's impossible to actually manually set all the parameters for each grain. So we need a global unit of organization to. Uh, um, to uh, control the uh, grain data with just a few parameters and uh, let the uh, algorithm cover the, the detail. So um, this is uh, what a grain looks like. Um, actually, it contains a wave waveform. This waveform c c could be synthetic 
or it could be from a sampled sound. And it is shaped by an uh, amplitude envelope, so it's just a uh, amplitude modul modulation. So uh, a, t a, a grain actually combines uh, time domain information and frequency domain information. So, um, okay. so yeah, and uh, these these are the uh, usual envelope used uh, uh, to to modulate the grain. Uh, a is the uh, Gaussian envelope, and B is the quasi-Gaussian envelope. And C, like D, is the triangular, and the E is uh, is a sync function. So um, these 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 envelope shapes has a great uh, effect on the uh, sound quality of the the grain itself. And like the the shape uh, of E, the sync function. If you use sync function, uh, it is said that the uh, the the grain will will be a uh, we're having a resonant texture, so it will be sounding like a wood block tapping or something like that. So uh, these are the methods methods to uh, globally control the the, the grain data, or the grain parameters include. Um, Fourier and wavelet grays method, and pitch synchronous overlapping streams, and quasi synchronous streams. And due to the uh, time constraint, I will only introduce the uh, last two methods. Uh, the first one is asynchronous granular synthesis. It is uh, mainly developed by uh, Professor Curtis Rose. And the last one is streams and clouds of granulated samples. So what is uh, asynchronous granular synthesis? This this is a, uh, a a frequency versus time plane, and uh, you can see that. Um, uh, so these are the parameters you can uh, actually uh, can specify by the composer. So uh, AGS uh, scatters the grains over a uh, specified duration. Uh, within a region. This region is called clouds. So clouds uh, is, uh, con uh, consists of uh, thousands of grains. It's a, uh, a higher level unit. Uh, so this is a cloud and this is the duration of the, the cloud. Um, so the grain duration did al along, this, um, along this timeline you can, you can actually specify the uh, grain duration. So uh, the grain duration can vary, uh, can, how say, can vary uh, along this line. Uh, so, um, how to say, so e e each, each grain might have has its own duration, so they might be overlapping in, in, the, uh, in the time domain. So you can also specify the waveform, uh, the content, the content of the, the grain. So it could be a, a synthetic uh, waveform, or you can use the sample from uh, from other sound, and um, like can spatial distribution and amplitude and grain density. Uh, it controls the. Uh, Density of the grains that showed up in uh, in a specific region of the cloud. They can actually <coughs> specify the uh, frequency band uh, of the grain. So, um, so if you set set the frequency at a uh, specific value, they will become like a, uh, a pitch. You can you can hear the pitch. So, so this. This is called a strat stratus cloud. So uh, you can see there are three different uh, uh, three different clouds at uh, three different uh, frequencies. So it's a chorus. And um, this is the uh, another method called streams and clouds of granulated samples. It it is act it actually just um, it just um, how to say, erasing a small part of a sampled sound, 
and uh, applies the uh, envelope or, s the, or just say the window to it. Then we can decide uh, in what order uh, are these grains uh, emitted or scattered. Uh, these can be controlled by the uh, composer. So uh, you can see, uh, yeah, this is the, the, the whole process. And uh, the whole process can, um, uh, can be carried out in real time. So it's uh, it's very uh, how to say power, powerful algorithm. Um, so the the results uh, that uh, comes from the uh, granular synthesis are mostly used as sound materials or sound effects uh, for musical composition composition and uh, mostly in uh, electroacoustic music or computer music because they uh, they. They're just not like uh, those very usual sounds, more like a, uh, how to say, a very, it has very scary texture. But it can also uh, achieve DSP goals like uh, time stretching or pitch shifting. It's, it means that you can um, change the, the, the duration of, it, uh, of a, of a uh, sound piece without varying its pitch, or you can change the pitch uh, without varying its duration. Uh, so granular synthesis is actually not uh, that important a uh, a method, but some people just you know just obsessed with it. So yeah. So these are the sources you can uh, look to. So here are. Uh, I, I have downloaded a uh, PD patch, uh, which carries the, uh, let me see. So this patch, uh, it shows how to um, uh, implement the uh, how is it? time, uh, pitch, pi pitch shifting with uh, granular synthesis. So we can now, uh, show you. So um, this is the uh, the music at its uh, normal pitch. So um, these these uh, these these two phaser and uh, these these uh, I'll say this window is actually the uh, the grains. Uh, like two hundred fifty six is the uh, it is the duration or it's the size of the grain it's here. And uh, the fa phaser is a uh, sawtooth generator, and uh, uh, I would say uh, so. This whole part can be viewed as a uh, grain generator, and uh, it contains uh, this. So, if you if you change the uh, frequency of the playback rate, you can hear the effect. So um, it's, it's um, more like if if we uh, because uh, the sound is sampled at um, forty four point one kilohertz, and um, <coughs> I don't know how to explain this. Um, can um, So this parameter here, it uh, decides the frequency at which um, the grain re reads the uh, content from the uh, from the actual sound sample, and um, <sighs> say sorry, I don't know how 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 to explain this because. Uh, 
Yeah. Sample takes overlapping yeah. handling window ones, and it just plays them back as faster. So if, if you're trying to play back, if you, when you raise the rate, yeah. it, it's got the current pair, which is what happens. It's read from the sample, which is the cycle through the graph yeah. that it has by the, the frequency content goes up. Yeah. And, uh, yes. So, any questions? Do you have any examples of the, uh, the random cloud thing? Uh, cloud thing. No, but, but I actually, uh, have. Another another patch. This this is a, a more uh, <coughs> this this one is a little more a little bit simpler. It just takes in a a, a wave and uh, just hugely ch changed its appearance. So it actually looks like that. Yeah, so basically. Yeah, because uh, if you think of it as a uh, amplitude modulation, so it will affect the uh, spectrum of the the uh, the yeah the content of the spectrum. So it will uh, you have those psi how to say psi frequencies or you introduce introduce it, because you can think think of it as a, a window, right? Because if you want to take, like you want to take a SDFT window or something like that. So the, the shape of the window will affect, heavily affect the uh, spectrum. So I know you're, you're talking a little bit about how, so when you're synthesizing something, do you mainly just mm -hmm. take, I know you said you could either be synthesized or like sampled music. Mm -hmm. Is it like, is it to create like music at different shifts, at different pitches, or is it just to like sort of change the effects of how it's going? Like, you know, like just now. Yeah, you can just ran, just change its order of appearance because you can you can chop uh, you can randomly uh, uh, arrange the order of you can you can chop the uh, original sample into a uh, very large amount of grains and. Just reorder or something. So I have an. Uh, so this this, mm -hmm. this method is going to just make like it's like weird effect you just can't know. Yeah. Right. Right, but I mean, it, you know, what the ones that we saw were starting with real sounds and then modifying. But the the previous method, the, the Curtis Ferris thing, I think that starts from scratch. You specify a bunch of parameters, you know, with his interface or whatever. Cloud and frequencies, but then they're all generated from scratch, and so you end up with a sound which is like, again, a very peculiar kind of sound. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, so next. Thank you, that's very interesting. Okay, good morning. 
So I'm going to talk about some uh, paper I, I've read uh, recently about the music genre classification. And uh, music is like uh, everywhere in our daily life, uh, with the increasing storage, uh, increasing size of the storage device, uh, many music files has been uh, converted into digital format and saved into uh, in a digital format. And with the more convenient and the cheaper recording devices and the increasing speed of internet, the online music data has been spread out uh, in a enormous speed. So with this huge music database, it becomes more and more important that we can find a way to uh, classify these music files. And, uh, uh, into categories so that we can uh, uh, describe the style of the music uh, very easily or retrieve some type of music uh, very easily. And th there's a powerful and powerful website called mu allmusic.com uh, that provides a, a, a large online database of music information. The songs and albums and artists are classified and annotated into different tag of genres, such as uh, you can see, you can see, pop rock or jazz or blues, something like that. And we can use this tag of genres uh, for the artist and search for the artists of the specific type, or search for the uh, songs that similar to your, the songs you like. Okay. So the music classification can also be applied to different kinds of uh, programs or on online services. As you can see here, uh, the first one is called iTunes Radio. And in iTunes Radio, we can select a, a specific music type. And uh, 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 iTunes Radio have compiled the, the music in the, the same type. So we can listen to the, the music and songs of the same type together. And uh, the other one is called uh, Pandora Radio. And in Pandora Radio, we can input uh, the name of the, uh, a song or a name of a specific artist uh, and, and use this as a seed to generate a personal um, radio channel. And while you are listening to this radio, uh, radio channel, you can uh, tag, this, tag the song playing, uh, whether you like it or you don't like it. And the radio will uh, adjust the music content they play according to the, 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 your, your preference. And uh, the third one is called less.fm. And they'll, in less.fm, less .fm, they'll uh, analyze the, the music you listened and, uh, or you move the, the, the artists you like and recommend other artists or songs that, for you. So there's some, there's several ways to do this music classification. Uh, first, uh, the mo the most accurate way, uh, but the, I think it's the most exhaustive way, is to hire a large number of uh, music experts to judge whether uh, the song is belong to some genre. For example, maybe this singer is a rock singer or an R&B singer, or a, a guitar guitarist plays is playing a music, uh, a blues music or jazz music, and uh, this is how. Allmusic.com and uh, I think Pandora Radio do uh, to perform their classification. And uh, in Pandora Radio, they take uh, they took about uh, 30 experts, musical experts, for five years to complete the classification in their project. And they use uh, about 400 musical attributes to help the the classification process. And uh, Another approach to do this classification to, is to analyze the user activities 
on the website. Uh, for example, if a uh, old user uh, says that he, he, he likes uh, artist A and artist B uh, simultaneously, and if a new user comes and say and he says he likes artist A, and we maybe we can infer that uh, he may also like artist B, so we can recommend artist B to the new 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 user. And this is how uh, online shopping website do. So, and the, the last one is much more automatically. Uh, uh, in a pattern recognition uh, problem, we, we usually uh, first extract some feature about the target, in, target uh, objects, and then use some classifier to cluster the objects together and using some predefined labels. So similarly, in, in music classification problem, we first uh, extract some audio features uh, of that song. And then we apply the generic tags uh, defined by the musical e experts. And then class use the classifier to do the classification, uh, such as uh, k-nearest neighbor or support vector machine something like that. So I'm going to talk about some audio features that are used in uh, music classification. So the first one is called timbral textual feature. Timbre is defined as a, let's see, a perceptual feature that makes two sounds of the same pitch and same loudness sounds different. And uh, this kind of feature is based on the uh, short time Fourier transform and original originate from the speech recognition and the speech music discrimination. And they are uh, they are calculated on short time Fourier transform. And uh, but but the texture window is a little bit long larger than the the window we use uh, in to to maintain a static texture of the in the window, and we extract the coefficient to represent the magnitude or the magnitude change of the in time domain and frequency domain. Okay, the other one is called a rhythmic content feature. Uh, they use a a beat tracking technique and a uh, bit his histogram is constructed and we use some coefficient to analyze the bit histogram of the regularity of the rhythm or the mm, relation of the beats, beat magnitudes. And the third one is called pitch content feature. Uh, also they use a pitch tracking system, a uh, pitch tracking techniques. Uh, uh, and a pitch histogram is constructed and is used to analyze the distribution of the frequency band of the target zone. And if we and after we these features are extracted, we can use these features and uh, apply them to uh, some machine learning classifier and to do the classification. Okay. And this is some reference about the musical generic classification. Uh, any <laughs> question? Excuse me, why like Pandora or all music they don't use pattern recognition methods? Uh, I think the accuracy is much more important in their like, uh, in their in their application. So it's not accurate I I think I think right now it's not so accurate enough. And uh, actually the allmusic.com and Pandora is about uh, five or six years ago. They already online, yeah. Um, you go back one slide. <coughs> so you're talking about, um, are these features all used like at the same time, or these are like three separate ways to do it? 
to like recognize like what genre music might be? I think they are all extracted and then put into the classifier. So you like like they'll extract something and then they'll be like, if this is like a certain type of music, I have this certain shape. Yeah, kind of. Uh, I think it depends on the how the genre are defined. If the if the um, if the genre is a very or how to say it, uh, for example, if if, if may they they can maybe separate the rock and uh, or electronic something like that. But they can maybe they cannot separate. Uh, like, um, um, progressive rock or break, break rock, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll be talking a little bit more. Oh, hi. Yeah, you did. Why well, you want you want to present now? Yeah, I I, I, pre I prepared. Oh, okay. Uh, um, sorry, I I didn't. I, I guess I misunderstood your email. All right, let's go. That's fine. It'll, it'll, we won't have much time for doing the relapse thing, but that, that's, that's okay. Okay, come on up. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't sort of figure what you were talking about. Today I'm gonna. Uh, oh, sorry. Today I'm gonna to introduce you the few methods to uh, try to estimate the fundamental frequency. The first, first it is uh, today's agenda, and uh, uh, first I'm gonna to talk about the motivation why we wanted to try to extract the fundamental frequency, try to estimate the fundamental frequency during the original sound sample. Like if you. Uh, Suppose if uh, there is an FBI team trying to bug the, the group, uh, try to bug the composition of the group of mafia and try to, you know, try to over uh, eavesdrop what they are talking about, and uh, they got the they got a sample and full of the noise and the background. So they, after after they get a tape, they have to extract the uh, very important information from this sound sample, and the, fun the fundamental frequency will help them. The yeah, second is that if you if you are the and the thing that like you try to perform in the open mic night or whatever and you want to copy this music, you feel very painful to download music online. So probably you have to do it by yourself. So if you wanted to make the accomplished music of the uh, of the pop song of the pop singer to cut the vocal to cut the vocal voice in the in the sound sample and the first thing you have to make sure what is the fundamental frequency because the fundamental frequency is uh, contained uh, uh, most contain uh, most of information about the uh, 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 most of information about high pitch and the reason. So and uh, there is a uh, two reason to try to estimate fundamental frequency. The first is predominant uh, uh, fundamental frequency estimation. So it, it is it is probably based on the PDF with a pro probability density function. Try to uh, try to estimate the posterior probability of the each. Mm. Each uh, in each time interval, uh, which energy dominates 
which added, uh, which energy of the spectrum dominates this time table and try to make it as a query to be the fundamental frequency. Mm -hmm. And the second is spectrum word. Actually, it is a, uh, actually it is it is grammatically wrong because uh, this this terminology is uh, is it based based on the inverse um, in inverse alphabetically for the word spectrum. So which is which implies this tech uh, this technology is based on the inverse Fourier transformation. And the third, I'm uh, gonna to talk about the application of this. Uh, Method. First, if we try to describe the music, and uh, there are five things we have to care about. The first, uh, the first is a hierarchical beat structure. It's normally it's the beat structure of the of the music, and the, it contains uh, several information of the structure of music, and also the information about the speed of speed of every beat of the note. And the second is chord change possibility. Possibility you can see, and the. Uh, for the fundamental frequency, the main note is like that, and uh, and then for the for its harmonic structure, you can see you can see the chord change slightly. So it is a pro it, uh, it generally um, represents the possibility of the change of the chord. And the third is the drum pattern. Normally, if uh, if you have the music with the with the drum a compass inside, like right, let's say a snail drum or whatever, so you, uh, you request a description of this pattern, but if you have, uh, if the music sound sample is without, is without the drama compass, and this representation is useless. Um, four is the melody line. Melody line is the normally is the temporary, uh, temporal treasury of the temporal treasury of the music structure, and uh, basically it is a, uh, it is. Uh, it is about the group of the high pitch and the high frequencies of the uh, of the sound sample. In, if we try to observe it intuitively, if you have the music and then you uh, try to guess the reason, to try to guess the main reason of the music, to like uh, if you have the box on Mozart's music and you try to you try to extract uh, you try to extract the fundamental frequency and the the, meta, the melody line is. Uh, Normally, will tell you which which part is the fundamental frequency, and then it becomes to the complex music, becomes to the complex note, and whatever. So it will be a harmonic structure, which I'm going to tell is the bass line. The bass line is basically bass line is uh, bass line is basically a group of notes which resides in the low frequency. But uh, you know, the probably the uh, uh, probably the in a real place and. The, in a real place, sometimes you can even uh, try to detect the try to detect the accomplished music. Uh, try to detect the bass line in the in the high frequency, so it will be very confusing. But uh, um, you know, I, I don't think um, we can use one of one or two algorithms and try to you know try to uh, process the every music signal. To, like if you have a very easy not. I'm not sure all the all the piano music this is not for that uh, polyphonetic sound sample and you can basically try to try to make assumption that the, the melody line is residing on high frequency and the fast line to the low frequency and you use the best fast uh band computer to try to try to separate these two lines. But if you have the uh let's say the hard rock music and a, a more complicated music, uh more complicated Casing music sample, and if you will make this consumption, it will be too arbitrary. So and uh, so during the, if you try to during the real case, you have to adjust the parameters and the and the correspondent algorithm or whatever. <coughs> so it is the first uh, algorithm I try to try to share with you. It's a prefix. If you see, um, it is the. Normally, it is the structure how the system works, how the algorithm works. The first thing, if you come to the real, if you come to a real audio signal, and uh, uh, you can you can try to extract the frequency component into the high frequency bound and low frequency bound, like I have introduced before. And uh, uh, the high frequency the high frequency bounds of the 
a general represent the Maryland line and the low frequency bounded general represent a boss line. So and uh, if you have the if you divided the the total sound sample into the two part, then you cannot uh, uh, then you, you can generate to know which which node is citing the melody line, which node is in the bus line. And uh, for these two part and uh, our job is try to predict the uh, pre uh, predict the harmonic structure of the melody line and the bus line. Because normally if we we got a sound sample and uh, Normally, if we uh, if we got a sound sample and uh, the 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 melody the melody is not a very uh, very simple structure or combination of the notes, it also contain a different it, it also contain a different tone model we call it agent. Like uh, like if we if we, it comes to the yeah. <laughs> if it comes to the Uh, Hang on, there's a problem with the microphone. And uh, uh, if we had come to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's alright. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. So, like, normally, if we have some sample and uh, um, the melody usually is, com uh, is composed of the different agent, and uh, even for the boss line, it's also composed with the different agent. The different agent, actually, uh, if we if you try to observe in this diagram, you see the different agent also have the sub uh, sub fundamental frequency, which is also is not quite distinguished from the from uh, try to distinguish from other agents. And if you try to observe it generally, and but it is uh, it is quite it's quite obvious if you observe in the in the sub time table. And uh, so then, how how can we extract the um, how can we extract the uh, the detail of the tone model of um, of the total structure? Um, the method we basically refers to is uh, what I introduced it before is the probability density function that is PDF and um, if we um, so like uh, uh, because the music because the music structure cannot be described uh, cannot be described by the um, by the by the one one or same by the one or two um, probability is distribution function because um, if we observe into the sub time table it is it is uh, quite different from each other so normally and uh, we try to uh, truncate into a different time table and find which uh, find in, in the each time table which which frequency which uh, which energy of the spectrum would dominate would dominate in each time table and then we can make the uh, we can make the approximately estimation for <coughs> for this uh, uh, for the value of the fundamental frequency and the, for the, also for the value of the salient uh, salient peak of each agent and. Uh, and then you can you can try to guess the weight of each agent in the total uh, in, the t in the total harmonic structure. Then um, then we also have the salient detector. Intuitively, actually, um, it is a it is a kind of a uh, iterative technique. You try to uh, try to uh, try to double check the the salient peak of each agent. So, like if you, um, so like uh, for the first iteration, and uh, at each agent, I try to uh, try to calculate the PDF in each time table, and uh, and they come up the solution and come and give you an answer which uh, which one is the fundamental it, it's a comparatively fundamental frequency in this time table, which one is the salient peak, and um, and then it, it pass it and pass this information in the next agent. If the next agent also agree, then it, then it's then it's okay. So, but if you come to this and this agent should pass the information, pass, pass the pass the information of CMP back to the back to the this agent, and actually the, for this agent it doesn't agree, so it will so it will be penalized. So through this way, and we can direct, uh, we we can approximate to extract the uh, to extract the basic uh, 
to model it in detail. And um, uh, and for outcome, we can extract the um, the the relatively rel the relative uh, structure of the melody line and the pulse line. Then, then it is the then it is the, the second technique I'm trying to trying to share with you, which is called stack stack mode. Um, don't worry, before I try uh, before I sh try to introduce you the technique, of course I have to make the assumption that each that every um, if you uh, if you have if you have the word sound sample and you, you make the assumption you um, sometimes you can make assumption that and uh, the total uh, the total sound sample share one harmonic structure. So like if you have the if you have the piano music or if you have the, the violin music or whatever and it doesn't have a it doesn't have a polyphonic uh, phonet, uh, phonic song and and then you can use the you can use this technique to to make assumption that they share the, the same harmonic structure, so the, the uh, so the problem will be simplified. Like if we um, if we try to if we try to observe in a system as a system that if uh, there is the input signal and the passive system, and the output signal is the convolution of the input signal and the impulse response of the system. And so vice versa, if we know the output signal and uh, the impulse response of the uh, impulse response of system, we can try to predict input signal. So uh, it is the basic and simple, uh, simple tricks we are trying to play around with this technique. Like, um, uh, since we have made assumption, we share the, uh, for the linear, for the linear frequency space, and uh, every, mm, every truncate of the sound sample share the, share the similar harmonic structure, so even even if the, the change of fundamental frequency and the, it will reside, it will lead to the uh, it, it will it, it will it, it will lead to the linear change of the each cellular peak. So uh, so if you observe in the log frequency domain and uh, if you, if uh, the fundamental frequency can move a little bit, it's suppose it's a delta uh, delta omega and uh, and uh, then and then the the second peak of the um, of the different agent and also will move in, into the same level. So and uh, if we if uh, in the time in the time zero and we can try to and we can try to extract the impulse response of the of this harmonic structure we call it H and HX. Then then it is out. Um, then U X is the fundamental frequency, and uh, the fundamental frequency that uh, try to convolve the impulse response of the of the system function, and we can get an output signal that is the real that is real time signal what we observe in um, what we observe in, in the in the spectrum, and then we can just to do the inverse and try to uh, try to implement the uh, the same harmonic structure that. As the system function and into the next case and uh, try to predict the next interval, which is the fundamental frequency is. <coughs> so and uh, if we if we try to use the inverse Fourier transformation and uh, uh, and then we can uh, we can try to ops we can try to move the problem into the time domain into the frequency domain and then use the i i d f i um, i f t two try to uh, regenerate the fundamental frequency. So, and uh, there is uh, there is the uh, application in the in the lab that is um, um, that is invented by by the Shigaki Sagayama who is in the Tokyo um, Tokyo University and uh, Suppose there is a sound sample. The real case. Can you hear it? Oh. 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 Sorry. 
break. You see, you can uh, you can try to see as it,、um, it is quite um, um, uh, peaceful and、uh, piano sound and、uh, doesn't have a, a complex、uh, harmonic structure, and、uh, so we can normally use the we can normally use like this spec spec mode techniques to try to uh try to, try to simulate and、uh, try to estimate the fundamental frequency and、uh, and convert it MIDI. And we can do the comparison. So you can find. So the note is missed. One note is missed, and、uh, according to this, these techniques. But、uh, normally, and we can we can conserve the, the most of the fundamental frequency, most of information of the, of this music. Yeah. The other, the other oh yeah. Yeah, just for this, it is the. Oh,、uh, number four forty six. Okay, we can try to. I think it. It's used a different.、Uh, it's used a different uh, different uh, synthesis、um, technique too. To come up with the conversion of the MIDI, but、uh, normally the、um, the accuracy is the same. So it is. The, so it is. The. Why would it be missing faster notes? Ah,、uh, because we、uh, arbitrarily make the assumption that every、um, each time each timetable and the sound sample, ah,、uh, the sound sound sample and share the same harmonic structure. So like if we, ah.、Um, If we there was any sort of okay. <laughs> so any other question? No question. So when we're, when we're doing when we're doing this, most of the obviously the techniques we're talking about like multi-phonic tracking, right?、Mm -hmm. uh, so when we have、um, different,、uh, more difficult music it becomes more difficult.、Uh, now you mentioned like that hitting like the five things of like aspects of music, and I guess I was. I was just wondering. You talked about how the, the drum beat one, and I was just wondering how that actually matters in terms of pitch tracking. I understand like the chord change, like the fundamental chord usually only changes like on the beat and stuff. But how does the drum beat? Because usually the drum beat is like you tap like the bass drum like on the main beats, but it's actually sort of just complicated and just the sound. Yeah, I was wondering how that、I、chord just translates to pitch. Yeah. If you if you try to observe in the drum beat, like、um, the,、uh, as for the pitch, it, there is a not obvious difference between the between the pitch change, but there is a well be the obvious change and the obvious variation with the beat structure. Like and we can try to like if we click it once and then twice, you know there will、uh, if we try to observe in a spectrum, there will like the Gaussian random Distribution and、uh, at the fundamental frequency, and then it、uh, dying away. The sound is trying to dying away, and then、uh, you can try to、uh, you can try to catch the second peak, and then try to regenerate the the structure, the B structure that I introduced. It's a hierarchy B structure of the of the notes. Okay, so this is so it is also important to these things. It's also like the individual notes and like how like how long and short they are, not not just like a pitch tracking. Yeah, I think、uh, it's different from the pitch tracking. Like、uh, for pitch tracking, and you can use the bandpass filter to try to、um, uh, try to divide it into into two two bars line, the first melody line, the other bars line. But for the I think for the drum beat and the,、um, it is、um, I don't think it's quite effective. You <laughs> try to divide it into the two the frequency band.
much. All right. so thank you. Thank you. So, well, um, you know, we, we will touch upon um, many of these topics again later in the semester, thanks. So that's a nice introduction just to set up some of those. Um, um, thank you. To set up some of those problems. Okay. Um, well, that was kind of unexpected timing, so things are a little bit short now. Um, what I wanted to do for the practical this week was to look at reverberation um, because we didn't really get to talk about it that much on Monday. And uh, I don't know, for those of you who've ever um, played with any kind of music making equipment, um, uh, reverb is like this incredible <laughs> ingredient that you can take a, a recorded track and you can add reverb to it and it just sounds, I mean for me it just really adds a lot to the quality of the sound. It just, I mean, it's, it's basically simulating the effect of the sound being played in a, a large hall, but it has this kind of very powerful and important effect on the sound. And um, it turns out that, you know, it's actually, it's relatively, um, you know, compared to having to go out and take your equipment to a hall and record it in a hall, artificial reverb does quite a lot of the job and um, is not so, not so difficult to implement. So um, we're not going to have time really to break up and play with this now, but it is, it's all on the website uh, under the practicals here. So this is the, you know, the, the patches and a list of things to, to try to look at. But I just thought maybe the easiest thing now is if I just go through this, um, you know, we do it sort of in a, in a, sen in a single, a single um, as, a, as a single group. So this is the reverb patch. And it, it basically, this is what we see now is just the, um, the control structure, just the, the parts that allow us to play with it. The actual reverberator is in here. The stuff up here is just to, to feed, to give us the option to feed in a bunch of different sounds. Um, this thing here is like a radio button box. Oops. It lets you choose different things here and they, and they end up sending, sending the kind of the uh, trigger impulses down these different lines to get different things. So if we, and this is just a metronome here. And so if I run that, if I turn on the DSP, make it dry over here. Okay, so it's just sending an impulse into this, and that's what you know, a pure impulse sounds like. But if we put it through the reverberator, that's an impulse, as it were, in, in this reverberant hole. And then we can uh, also have little tone, tone blips. This is a 10 millisecond tone burst, 20 millisecond, 100 millisecond, 500 millisecond. And then we can also um, load a sound file. Um, so something like this. So the dry sound file is this. And then if we add the reverb, we get that much more spatial, diffuse sound. So um, this reverberator patch has a bunch of standard controls here. Um, liveness, crossover frequency, high frequency timing. Let's just listen to those on the, uh, on the straight impulse here. So this is all, all reverberation. Liveness is basically how rapidly the sound dies out that it, uh, with, a, with, loudness, with liveness approaching 100 sort of the sound stays in stays in the uh, reverberation uh, space for a long time. With a, with a small loudness, it dies away more quickly. So um, I think if we stop that now, what happens? Down here, it's actually trying to sample the impulse response. So every time we 
via this thing. It also triggers a thing here, which reads the data into um, a little buffer here, which you can then save out and load into MATLAB or something to analyze it. But you can't really see the difference. That's, that's, that's very high liveness. If I turn it way down like this, I've muted the sound. You can't really see the difference here, but you can hear the difference pretty clearly. Um, and then the, the high-frequency damping it allows you to have a more rapid dying away of the sound in the high frequency, and the crossover frequency controls where that happens. So if we listen to that, turn up the liveness. If I, if I turn down the high frequency damping, there's a lot of sort of, you know, hiss to it. And if I turn it up, In the high frequencies, the, in the low frequencies, the actual reverberation is the same. But in the high frequency, you can hear it dying away much more quickly. So um, it's, uh, it has this balance between the slower dying away of energy in the low frequency and the faster in the high frequency, which is what we have seen in real um, reverberant signals and real impulse responses. And the crossover frequency is just the, where, that, where that occurs. So you can make it, you know, more or less dramatic. It's kind of hard. Let's try that with the guitar, actually. So I'm going to vary the amount of high-frequency damping. So with a lot of damping, it sounds duller, lower crossover frequency. So you can get a pretty broad range of different kinds of rooms. A uh, uh, greater liveness sounds like a larger room because it sounds as the reflections are lasting longer. And then uh, less high-frequency damping sounds like a room with like harder walls because the high-frequency energy is being preserved, whereas more damping is like a room with wood or plaster walls where the, the high-frequency dies out quicker. So this is a nice set of controls to give you... Um, the kinds of reverberation you want. But the question is, how does this stuff work? And um, this is all based on... This particular reverberator is based on this paper from the mid-'80s by John Stoughton and Miller Puckett. Miller Puckett, who went on to, to, to build PD. And they have this nice approach to um, reverberation where you have a sort of a, a feedback network. You have a set of delay elements but then you have a sort of a mixing matrix which mixes up the outputs of the different delays and then feeds them back in. That's a three by three array, but the actual reverberator we're looking at is four by four. And they sort of, by, by looking at the, uh, by thinking about the, the natural modes of this mixing matrix, the, totally, the, the sort of the energy conservation, you can, uh, you can get what you want. Basically you want um, the eigenvalues of this matrix to be smaller than one to make sure we don't get energy building up in any kind of uh, pattern. So that's kind of like the long um, delay feedback. But there's also um, some early echoes, which is the very, the first few echoes are very important. They're the ones that you can maybe hear distinctly coming off the wall. So there's a separate implementation for early echoes. They, they simulate a four channel reverberator and they're sort of imagining something like this, where you have these different, four different delay lines coming from different directions then you have cross-linkage between the outputs of one direction and the inputs of the other directions. So, um, so you can see that in the paper, but in the, in the patch, so here's the actual patch. And um, um, these are the four delay lines, right? And so these are, these are Dell reads, and then these are the actual delays in milliseconds, they're between 58 and 86 milliseconds. They're sort of strange numbers, but the idea is that they should be non-co-prime, so they all have different, you know, when you add them together, you get different numbers, different total delays coming out. That's where we read them back, and here's down here is where we write them out. This is the input here. It goes through this early reflections patch, which we'll look at in a second. Then it basically gets fed into two of these, and this is the mixing matrix. So what happens is we take the, um, the two inputs here, 
and then also the outputs of the two other delay lines. And we have this 4 by 4 grid where we multiply them by these constants and then sum them up to, uh, to get the things that we then feed into the delays. Excuse me. And if you look at these constants down here, um, these are the actual numbers that come in a default rev2, and you see that they're different, they're different um, patterns. So the first input gets added with plus 1 to all of the inputs. Then the second input is plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. And we have 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. So like the four different uh, orthogonal bases you can have for a four-point four, four point structure. So they're all being mixed into the different delay lines in different amounts, which gives you, gives you sort of a maximum uh, mixing around. It's not in the, in the paper, they actually have ones and zeros. And here they're using ones and minus ones. I'm not exactly sure when that change came in, but, but I guess it gives better results. So we can actually um, run the reverb. We can run the impulse response in here. And we can play with these delays now and see what happens. And obviously, as you shorten the delays, the reverb time gets less because you're sort of scaling the whole room down. But it's also, it's kind of hard to hear, but if you play with this on your own, you'll be able to hear that certain delays give more metallic quality, that the actual, the default values are very nice and they give a fairly smooth and non-tonal character, but other less good combinations of values give you, um, give you more sort of metallic ringing. Because if there's any kind of periodicity in the reverberation, then you're going to hear that as some kind of tone. So the other thing I want to show, and so these are just, up here is just the controls of these different uh, inputs that we had. The liveness, right, which was the, how how fast things d decays away it doesn't actually change the delays it just changes the it applies a gain right liveness comes here and it applies these gains which is how much of the um, how much of the sort of feedback gets fed forward so as you turn the liveness down then there's less energy sort of looping around right it comes in here and here so it's the outputs of the delays being fed back into the input of the matrix and the, the high frequency damping, here there are, at the outputs of each of these filters, there's a low pass filter. And then basically, we set the low, low pass filter splits the output of the, the delay into a low pass and a high pass term. And we scale the high pass term by the high frequency damping so we can add further attenuation to just the high frequencies. So it's like we're turning down the liveness separately for the high frequencies. Okay, the last thing I want to look at was this early reflections. And so this is like the input comes in, the input impulse or whatever it is. And then it goes through this patch before it gets fed into the delay network. And this is what this patch does. It's just a set, a fixed set of delays here. And they've, you know, they're just a, they're sort of their FIR delays, right? So the, the feed forward delays just has a delay with a particular length and then it reads it out here. Then, um... Let's see, that gets subtracted from the input, and then that gets fed into another delay with a different amount. And then that gets uh, subtracted from the sum of the input and those. So there's some kind of uh, mixing of these things going on, but basically it's just this chain of delay lines, which just sets up a, a, a pattern of, um, of takes initial impulse and just diffuses it out in a, in a Again, a fairly random pattern, but just simple, simple delays. And so down here, we've got a slider which allows us to crossfade between just having a direct single impulse coming through and having these early echoes. And if we listen to the effect of that, I guess I'm still running here. This is with the early echoes. And this is without the early echoes. You can still hear the reverberation, right? You can hear some ringing going on. But that early echo is very important in kind of making it, smoothing it out and making it seem diffuse. In fact, if we uh, go to the liveness and turn it all the way down to zero here, that basically means we only have one part. We, have, we don't ever have anything coming out from the, from the uh, echo delays. And so all we're hearing is the, uh, is the early echoes. And so that's just the direct impulse. And this is the, uh, the early echoes coming through. So... Um, 
you can sort of hear them as a sort of little pulse, chain of pulses. But then when we turn back up the, the liveness, the, the later delay lines, that then becomes this much richer reverberant quality, which sounds more like a room. So um, the things I didn't get to play with here, just trying to see what happens if you actually change some of these feedbacks, if you take out some of the links or change them from being these kind of this uh, orthogonal set of mixing rows, you can get different effects. Um, and then, you know, looking at the different uh, impacts of the delay lines. But that gives you a basic idea of how this thing works. And the impulse response, so like I say, you can, read, you can use this to sample the impulse response and then read it into MATLAB and you can see where the actual impulses fall and see how the sound falls out of the impulses. But we didn't have time for that. So, but I just wanted to make sure that you'd at least seen the insides of a reverberator so you get an idea of how a synthetic reverberator like this can operate. And it's actually pretty inexpensive, right? Because mostly what w most of the work's been done, being done by the delay lines in terms of the actual multipliers. You know, we've got like some plus and minuses in here, but there are no gain terms in here. It's just a few, a few filters in, in the chain that give you the entire effect. Any, any questions or anything? You want to try out? Want me to try out for that? All right. I guess we'll leave it at that, and um, we'll see what see what happens next week. Okay. Thanks.